Good evening and a very warm welcome to Literature Live's first Brightness of Books evening of the year. My name is Tina Nagpal and I'm a member of the Literature Live committee. It is my pleasure to welcome our speakers Ramchandra Guha and Naresh Fernandez today. This evening, editor of Scroll Naresh Fernandez will be in conversation with author and historian Ramchandra Guha to discuss his book Rebels Against the Raj. Western Fighters for India's Freedom. I'd like to remind our audience to send in questions for the Q&A segment at the end of the session. And now I'd like to hand over the session to our speakers for what promises to be a very insightful session. Naresh, over to you. Thank you, Tina. Good evening and welcome to this discussion uh, about the enthralling new book by Ramachandra Goha, uh, a man I'm privileged to call a mentor and a close friend. If uh, you, like me, were a student at St. Andrew's School in Bandra in the 70s and 80s, you'd have encountered the energetic Mrs. Coley. Uh, she taught PT and French, but mostly you'd remember the enthusiasm which, uh, with which she approached Independence Day and Republic Day. And you'd remember the vivid stories she told about her time in Subhash Chandra Bose's Indian National Army. Mrs. Kohli, as we later came to know, had been born to a German father and a Japanese mother in Shanghai. Uh, in one schoolyard telling of events, she had been walking around uh, Shanghai as a teenager one day when her attention was captured by an impassioned man making a speech on a street corner. Come help me free my country, we were told the man said. Uh, the charismatic man in the story, or so went the story, was Bose. Uh, the teenage Mrs. Kohli left her family to join the Indian National Army, where she fell in love with the dashing Madan Mohan Kohli, uh, who had given up his studies in glass technology in Japan to join the Azad Hind Forge. A few years after independence, they moved to Bandra, where she lived the rest of her life. Um, I was reminded of Mrs. Kohli uh, as I was reading uh, Ram's uh, book uh, about the seven renegades against the Raj. Um, Rams really sketched out their lives in a very gripping way. Uh, but I realized that uh, I didn't actually know her name before she got married. So I called her daughter. Uh, the woman we, know, we knew as Mrs. Kohli had been born Olga Schottler, she told me. Um, and she sent me right on that schoolboy, uh, that schoolyard story. Evidently, Madan Mohan Kohli had come to Shanghai from Japan to deliver a message to an INA officer there when he set eyes on the young Olga. He fell in love at first sight. Uh, Mrs. Kohli's stories were the first inkling my classmates and I had about the fact that India's struggle against imperialism was so resonant, it had drawn participants from around the world. Uh, but Ram, uh, under the criteria you've chosen, uh, by, by which you chose characters for this book, a German-Japanese teacher wouldn't really qualify as a renegade, would she? Well, that's a beautiful story, and I'll come to it in a minute. But first, let me begin by saying how uh, delighted I am here to, uh, to be part of uh, the first uh, Brightness of Books conversation. And let me offer a toast to the memory of our friend Anil Dharkar, who is um, the moving spirit behind this festival and this initiative. And it's wonderful that Amy Fernandez and her team are carrying on uh, this incredibly, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, stimulating and idea-packed adventure with literature across different genres. Now, your story is utterly fascinating. And, um, you know, Mrs. Kohli, who's actually Olga Schrotzler, half, uh, half German, half Japanese, I was imagining, uh, uh, you know, with that name, a very kind of elegant Punjabi lady in Salwar Kameez. Maybe she was Salwar Kameez, but she obviously didn't look, look Punjabi. You know, uh, my book is, uh, Mrs. Kohli's story is entirely resonant with or consistent with my book. You know, I think my book is about foreigners who joined the freedom struggle. Many of them came in the late 19th century. Like Mrs. Kohli, several changed their name. So Satyanan Stokes became, uh, I pick up on Samuel Stokes became Satyanan Stokes. Uh, uh, you know, at least two Stokes and a man called Philip Spratt uh, uh, married Indians. Uh, but I had to... Uh, you know, maybe my book will spark stories of uh, lesser known relegates like, like Mrs. Kohli. 
but I focused on the seven on whom I had interesting new material and through whose interwoven lives I could tell the story of late 19th and early 20th century India. You're mute, you're, you're mute. Sorry, I was on mute. Could you please give us thumbnail sketches of these seven renegades uh, so our audience gets a sense of the characters in the book? So let me go chronologically because that's how, in a sense, I introduce each one of them. So there's Annie Besant who comes in 1893, uh, who's the only one who's already middle-aged in her mid forties and has a, a quite remarkable career as a suffragette and, and socialist behind her in England. She had become a theosophist, comes to India because the theosophists thought India was the land of gurus and mystics, where she works on women's education, promoting the Theosophical Society, and then uh, becomes active in politics. She's three-fourth Irish. Uh, so when the Irish Home Rule Movement starts in 1915-16, she starts a Home Rule League for India and is arrested, becomes the first female president of the Indian National Congress, and later on is eclipsed by Tilak and then by Gandhi and dies a rather embittered old lady, but after an incredibly interesting and diverse life. So she's the first. Then I come to my second renegade, who's very much a, a man of Bombay, B.G. Honeyman, uh, immortalized in the circle outside the Asiatic Society, one of the nicest parts of my favorite city uh, in India. And Honeyman, as you know, Naresh was in the same profession as you. He was an editor, like you, an independent-minded editor, more polemical in style than you, but uh, as fiercely committed to the freedom of the press, uh, deeply interested in the life of the subaltern classes of Bombay, the workers particularly. And he was deported because of his editorials on the Jalyan Wala Bagh massacre in 1919, and then comes back after seven years in England. He was also almost certainly gay, uh, which is a very interesting and transgressive and admirable part of his life. And he must have had Indian lovers, but unfortunately, we don't have more concrete details about that aspect of uh, his, his life. And he dies in 1948, just after India becomes independent. The third of my renegades is an American, whom I already mentioned, Samuel Stokes, uh, who came as a missionary, left the church, joined Gandhi's non-cooperation movement, spent several months in jail, comes out of jail, uh, is somewhat disenchanted with Gandhi's obsessive interest in spinning. He's making spinning mandatory to Congress membership. Meanwhile, he's married a local Pahari girl in Himachal. And Stokes then uh, pioneers the horticultural industry in Himachal. He, you know, he popularizes the growing of apples. And of course, that has sustained Himachal ever since. Uh, it, he gets disenchanted with Orthodox Christianity and becomes a Hindu in the early 30s and changes his name to Satyanand and dies in 1946. So he's number three. Number four is probably the best known uh, to a younger audience or to an Indian audience generally. And this is the daughter of an English admiral born as Madeleine Slade, who was a concert pianist till she read about Gandhi and then totally flipped and became a disciple of the Bapu and his adopted daughter and went by the name Mira, Mira, uh, Mira Ben. Now, parts of Mira Ben's story are very well known. Her devotion to Gandhi, uh, her courting of arrest in the civil disobedience movement in the 1930s, her propaganda tours to the USA and the UK on behalf of the Indian freedom struggle, the time she spent with Gandhi in the Aga Khan Palace. So she was with Gandhi when Kasurba died, for example, in 1944. But what is less well known and which I sketch in some detail in this book is what happens after she leaves Gandhi and does, uh, goes to the Himalaya, where she becomes a pioneering environmentalist, speaking about the importance of biodiversity, warning against the impact deforestation would have on floods and and, and the local ecology and so on. And then she, of course, goes back to Europe where she influences uh, the making of Attenborough's film. So she's number four. Number five uh, is a fascinating character called Philip Spratt, who's a Cambridge communist who comes to blow up India uh, and is based again in Mumbai for quite uh, a, a long period with, uh, you know, uh, mobilizing the working classes along with people like Dange and Jhabwala and Ghate and other well-known communists of that day is arrested in the famous Merit conspiracy case, spends several years in jail. Why is he in, he's in jail, starts reading Gandhi and is cured of, uh, uh, of communism. Uh, and uh, then becomes a journalist in my hometown, Bangalore. In fact, his press was right behind uh, where I now live. He was editor of a magazine called Mice India, standing for Mysore India, 
a southern alternative to the then very popular Illustrated Weekly of India. Spratt marries a Tamil girl, and one of the great delights of my research was finding their correspondence, which is incredibly rich and moving, has several children by her, stays on in, stays on in India, becomes a passionate free marketer, and also a student of the Hindu personality. And he dies only in the 1970s. So he's number five. Number six is also an American, like Stokes, an American missionary called Ketan, who works in South India, in Madurai. Like Stokes, uh, he's unhappy with the Sahib life, life of the missionary, of the Protestant missionary. Ket comes close to Gandhi, is then deported because of his support for the Quit India movement, comes back after independence and plays a very important role in setting up the rural university in Gandhigram. And his followers are still active in actually rural development work in southern Tamil Nadu. And the last person is uh, an English woman called Catherine Mary Heilman, who adopted the Indian name Sarla Devi and set up a pioneering girls' school in Uttarakhand. She was also jailed in the Quit India movement, comes out of jail, starts this school in an incredibly backward and feudal and patriarchal part of India. Uh, part of India I know well because that's where I grew up and did my first research. And among the her wards in this school called the Lakshmi Ashram in the hill town of Kosani were future leaders of the Chipko movement. Now, Ali Besson, so those are seven thumbnail sketches of uh, these renegades. Each uh, led fascinating lives. Each were activists. All of them were writers. All of them were either imp imprisoned or deported. All of them had complicated relations with Gandhi, sometimes reverential, sometimes adversarial. So it's really a, through these lives, it's a history of India's encounters with the modern West over a century long period. You know, the, the thing that struck me in the book is everybody's always traveling. I mean, these are times when, you know, transport is not easy and they're taking ships and trains, bullock carts, they're traveling by horse, some of them. Uh, but I think the journey, not the physical journey so much as the philosophical journey of Phil Spratt is the one that is sort of the, the most dramatic. And of course, I love the fact that, you know, uh, he lived uh, on Brunt, uh, he worked on Brunton Road right next to you, uh, that he shopped at a select bookshop, <laughs> introduced me to, and for whom you've uh, sort of collected the Geddes volume. Uh, what were the elements of Spratt's life that drew you to him? Well, I, you know, uh, I mean, uh, of course, you know, um, there is possibly some projection, self-projection there because I was a youthful Marxist. I was cured of my Marxism, not by reading Gandhi, but by meeting, meeting the Gandhian leaders of the Chipko movement. Uh, I haven't gone right to the other extreme like Spratt did, uh, but I think it was also the fact that, um, you know, uh, he loved books. He lived a, lived a very ordinary life. You know, uh, one of my, uh, my mother-in-law, for example, my wife Sudhata's mother, Shanta Keshavan, who was an artist, used to attend these talks in the Institute of World Culture in Bangalore. You know, an older elderly journalist friend of mine, whom I knew when I was starting to write for the newspaper, P.K. Srinivasan, you know, uh, was totally intrigued by this Englishman who would go on a cycle, uh, get off in a small shop, a uh, restaurant, eat an idli and vada with a copy of Freud by his side. So, you know, I had all these kind of images that people told me about him. And then getting those letters, you know, the letters that he wrote uh, to his uh, wife, first his girlfriend, and then his wife, Sita, which the family graciously gave me. Uh, were very, very uh, moving. And uh, the, the letters are, you know, uh, very revelatory because Pratt was actually a very shy man, you know. Uh, and uh, many shy people are often like expressing themselves uh, in correspondence. You know, my first editor, Rukun Advani, for example, you can't get a word out of him if you're face to face with him. But you, as long as he's far away from you, you'll get these e long emails, you know, they used to be, handwritten letters on onion skin paper. Now they are 14 paragraphs, emails, e beautifully phrased, you know, sharp, perceptive, witty, um, humorous. And Spratt's letters were often like that. And it's a joy to read unpublished correspondence, you know, for a biographer to come across letters of, that are so revelatory, so moving, so insightful, and also quite funny, and also self-deprecatory because the humor is actually uh, very English. So it's often mocking himself. So yeah, Spratt is uh, certainly a, a most intriguing and fascinating character, and I was happy to be able to write about him. The other sort of set of letters uh, that you use uh, quite well, uh, you use to great effect, uh, 
Will you give us another glimpse into the personality of Mira Ben, uh, who in, you know, in our image is austere, devoted to Gandhi, and you find out about uh, an unrequited love that she has. Yeah, I mean, these letters are revelatory. Okay? These are not, these are actually in a public library. They're in the Nehru Memorial Museum and Library. And I should say a little bit about the man she fell in love with. So, uh, uh, Prithvi Singh Azad was from the Punjab, joined the Ghadar movement, uh, like many other Ghadarites traveled to uh, uh, North, North America, came back, was arrested, sent to the dreaded cellular jails in the Andamans, where he spent several years, uh, then came out, went underground, traveled under assumed name, and after more than a decade living underground, as a fugitive from the police, he landed up in Gandhi's ashram in Sevagram and said, I want to turn myself in, what should I do? And Gandhi said, turn yourself in, and I will write a letter to the authorities pleading that you get a light sentence. And while he was in the ashram for the first time, Meera Ben saw him, and she was in her mid-40s, this was the late 1930s, and totally flipped for him. You know, she just fell in love with this man, this handsome, bearded revolutionary with this charismatic past, who had abandoned the path of revolution to embrace the ahimsa of Gandhi. So then he goes, so he gets a two-year term, which he spends in the Punjab, and then comes back to Sevagram. And Meera is obsessed with him. She wants to make her life with him. And he is, firstly, he wants to rediscover the country he's been away from. He, he's now a free man because he say he's got remission. He's, he can travel and he wants to go around and he has these letters following him, you know. And actually, uh, uh, in my book, partly because of space, partly because the letters are heart-wrenching, I cut down how much I quoted, you know, because, but what I, what I quoted is enough to show the depth and uh, of Mira's love for him. Uh, and the fact that he kept the letters, you know, uh, you know, he didn't he did burn them. I mean, he put them in an archive and maybe he felt somebody would discover them. And uh, yes, I mean, they, 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 they are uh, a side of Mira Ben, which uh, is not part of the nationalist narrative at all. You know, just as there's a side of Gandhi, which I describe in my biography, where he was enchanted by Tagore's niece, the singer and poet Sarla Devi in Chaudhrani, which is also not part of the nationalist uh, narrative. In the nationalist narrative, you're only in love with the nation, you know, or the leader of the nation. You can't be in love with a flesh and blood human being. And in that sense, there's a parallel between Gandhi's brief, but certainly very intense devotion and, and uh, engagement with Sarla Devi and Meera Ben's unrequited love for Prithvi Singh Azad. It makes them much more human. I mean, we all fall in and out of love. We're not just in love with abstractions called nationalism, socialism, and so, and so on and so forth. Yeah. I mean, the other, again, it was such a delight to see a, a, a portrait of this man who I only know as a plaque uh, on, on, on the park wall, B.G. Horniman. Uh, and you tell us about this man who believes that journalism matters. Uh, also, uh, I wasn't aware of uh, disputations he had with his uh, board. Yes, yes. I think, I mean, in, in, in Bombay mythology, what we know is the Bombay Chronicle was, uh, was started by Firosha Mehta and it was a nationalist newspaper. <laughs> but he clearly uh, sort of uh, had some battles with them. Will you tell us some more about... Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, the Bombay Chronicle uh, was started in 1913 as a nationalist alternative to the pro-establishment times of India. And uh, it was started, as you said, by liberals like Firosha Mehta. They recruited Horniman. As the editor, he was already in India as assistant editor of the Statesman in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And uh, the paper was quickly identified with him because of the power of his own writing, because of the young journalists he nurtured. For example, among the people he nurtured were, were Pothan Joseph and S.A. Brelvi, you know, two Indians one from uh, United Provinces, one from Kerala, who became very notable editors in their own right. And there were others in this his table. You know, uh, there's a very remarkable Bengali sports writer called J.C. Maitra, whom I've written about in my book, Corner of Foreign Field, who vigorously campaigned for justice to be given to this remarkable family of Dalit cricketers, the Palwankar brothers. So he was also uh, part of Hollywood's table. So he, and the paper became his. I mean, he was running it. Uh, shaping it, orienting it towards the freedom struggle. Uh, and uh, this uh, offended the moderates who had started it. 
and he what and he you know and especially after he was deported he became a cult figure uh, so when he came back in 1926 brelvi said you take over the paper it's yours you know i i'm just a step in any time like a kind of a you know bharata to your ram you've come back from exile and you do you take over the paper and he wanted a seat on the board which the uh, guys you know uh, uh, the business people on the board would not give him so it's really you know and then he left and then he started something else and later on he comes back to the bombay chronicle and then he runs a uh, an evening uh, called bombay sentinel so it is you know it presages many battles between editors and their boards uh, of course not just in our country but also uh, in england and america and i think what was remarkable about him was uh his commitment to his staff so he started the first trade union of working journalists uh his interest in working class people so though he was a sahib uh, you know he wrote a lot about the textile workers he often gave speeches in uh, in the chols uh, you uh, you you know about uh, uh then also i think his interest in art in culture in film i think there is a great book to be written about the bombay chronicle so after independence and honeyman's death and uh, brailvi's death the the chronicle lost its salience it was no i mean the british had gone and you didn't need an advertisement paper like this but it was not just interesting for its politics narration it was very interesting and important for its coverage of film and sport and everyday social life and i uh, it's interesting that um, there's still that circle named after him which was never renamed in shiv sena rule you know even though uh the shiv sena is kind of antipathetic to foreigners and i wonder somewhere but this is pure speculation narish i wonder somewhere whether a bal thakare grew up at my at my holy will say editorials you know but he he said he's a jew of bombay was completely identified with that city i uh, was offered in court defending himself against libel suits so i think a biography of a newspaper you know would be a great idea i hope some young scholar reading about honeyman and the bombay chronicle wants to use the newspaper to map the cultural political social history of your great city from 1913 to 1956 which is the lifespan of this newspaper and what makes it uh, slightly easier for this future scholar is the fact that the asiatic society of bombay has digitized a lot of the copies and has put them online and it's it's such a delight to read them they had a weekend section that speaks that sort of covers film early uh there's our friend dosu karaka who writes bombay man's diary uh they really uh, sort of bring alive the various aspects of the city as you pointed out uh in a way that the state times of india which is also available on proquest uh, but it never does cost uh does not uh you know two of the the your, your characters are, are names that many readers uh, are likely to be encountering for the first time and I'll be the first one to confess my ignorance here. Uh, Catherine uh, Hellman, or Sarla Devi, as she came to be known, uh, finds a fleeting mention in Unquiet Woods, uh, your book published more than three decades ago. And then uh, Dick uh, Kethan or Keaton uh, makes a fleeting appearance in the second part of your monumental Gandhi biography, which was sort of published uh, in 2018. How did you go about fleshing out these stories? so again uh, with both uh, as with spread i was fortunate in having access to papers privately held so uh, with sarla sarla devi uh, i was uh, i went to the lakshmi ashram in kosani and uh, uh, her the person she handed over the ashram to is a remarkable woman called radha bhat who's 80 in her late 80s and probably uh, in my view the finest embodiment of the gandian spirit in india today still active full of energy with a sparkling sense of humor and so on and i did long interviews with her and her associate david hopkins who's an englishman who's become an indian and lives in the ashram and they gave me access to some of the letters and also to a lot of her writings in hindi so one of the things that writing about sarla ben did was to bring me back to the unquiet woods which is the last time i used materials in hindi for my research seriously and extensively so you know write her own autobiographical writings essays about her her journeys through india she wrote letters she was traveling through india in the 1960s and writing to her wards in um, kumau about what she found and kethar actually was a kind of a story which is out of um, you know it's the kind of things that biographers dream of i knew about him 
uh, I knew that he had spent his last days in a hospital in a small Tamil town of Odan Chatram, which serves the rural poor, whose founder A.K. Taryan was inspired by Ketan to start a hospital for the rural poor in a backward uh, part of Tamil Nadu. So I knew he had an association with that hospital. And there were two, again, I should mention them. Uh, there was a man called Bhumi Kumar Jagannathan, who's a psychiatrist in Cambodia, whose parents, uh, Krishnamal and Shankaralingam Jagannathan, were Gandhian social workers who were disciples of Ketan. And Vinu Aram, who is a public health specialist in, uh, in also in Tamil Nadu, and her parents too were inspired by Ketan. So, they, so with their uh, encouragement, I went to this hospital and I found out the room in which he lived. The, and where he died, you know, he spent his last days. And actually, in a cupboard like this behind me, there were all these papers. I just pulled it out and there were, there were all these papers. And um, I asked uh, Vinu Aram, what can I take them? She said, we trust you, just take them. You know, and I don't put this all in the book because the book is not about myself and my journey. It's about these seven remarkable people and their remarkable journeys. But that's how I was able to flesh out Kaitan's story in much more detail. Then there was a secretary of his I was able to uh, meet, uh, uh, you know, uh, called uh, K.M. Natarajan, who's a well-known Gandhian social worker. He put me in touch with somebody else who had a collection of, of Kaitan's letters. And, you know, these two people, Kaitan and Sarla Devi, as you say, I mean, I also only vaguely knew, knew about them, and I'm a, supposed to be a Gandhian scholar. I mean, it's no surprise that readers of this book like yourself would not have heard of them. But in their locality, they're still admired, you know. Their footprint in Tamil Nadu and, and Southern Tamil Nadu and, and Uttarakhand, respectively, is still visible. So it was a, you know, obligation to bring their work to a wider audience. Uh, and again, it was really the support and cooperation of their close associates who pointed me to where I would find new and interesting and rich material about them. You know, one complaint we frequently hear these days is that many people who uh, participated in the freedom struggle have been written out of history. And in the case of some of the figures championed by the ruling dispensation, um, that claim seems to ring quite hollow. I mean, to turn our eyes across Bombay, for instance, we have a Vallabhai Patel Stadium. Uh, the most iconic promenade that we call Marine Drive is actually named after Bose. There's an arterial road in Dadar named after Savarkar. Um, but Stokes and Kaithan and Spratt and Sarla, though they're not very, genuinely very well known. Um, yeah. could it be that the freedom movement was so broad based, it's just difficult to keep track of everybody who participated in yeah. it. Of the hundred volumes of the collected works of Gandhi, for instance, one volume that runs nearly 600 pages is just an index of the names of everybody whose who's, uh, name has appeared in the previous volumes. Uh, yeah, of course. And I think it's, I mean, I, I, absolutely. I mean, there's so many fascinating characters <laughs> whose stories are not told, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, <coughs> of course, I chose to focus in this book on the foreigners, you know, but if, if you go back to my biographies of Gandhi, you know, of course, Mahadev Desai, Gandhi's secretary, who had barely got his due in most biographies I was able to write about in detail, but some other people, because I'm mean, one of the people in my, in my, in my book who is there only in a few pages, is this Punjabi Muslim lady called Bibi Amtu Salam, who goes with Gandhi to Noakhali. And when there's a, when, uh, you know, uh, uh, she's a Muslim fa fasting for Hindu Muslim harmony, you know, and the Muslims had taken away some ritual swords from a temple and then she fasts till those swords are returned. And she stays on, you know, unlike other Punjabi Muslims who go to Pakistan, she stays on in India and that's social work. Now, she's not someone who's pretty written about. So there's a whole, you know, not just in the Gandhian stream, in the socialist stream, in the revolutionary stream, there are lots of fascinating characters whose stories have not been told. And, uh, you know, but I must say, I mentioned the Honeyman Circle, and you mentioned the roads named after Bose and, and Savarkar and so on. It's nice that there's an Annie Besant Road right through early. I mean, the center, when you drive to the airport, you know, you ha have to go through Dr. Annie Besant Road. And it's, it, those are markers that your city has retained, the Honeyman Circle and the Annie Besant Road, which, you know, is, is, is very nice. Mm. You know, equally fascinating in the book is what happens to these figures, those who were still alive after independence. 
uh, they continued to fight for a kind of India, an India for which they had given up familial attachments and gone to jail. They fight for Bapu Raj. Could you tell us something about these struggles? Uh, yeah. So uh, of uh, my, my seven uh, uh, protagonists, Andy Besson dies in the early 30s. Stokes dies in 1946, just before independence. Honeyman in 1948, just after independence. But four others continue to do creative and insightful and important work. You know, Mira Ben promoting environmentally uh, oriented practices in the Himalaya, quarreling with her former jailmate Jawaharlal Nehru for his insensitivity to agrarian and ecological interests. Ketan does similar things in South India. Spratt becomes a fighter for economic freedom. You know, he's a, a vigorous campaigner against the license permit Kota Raj. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think, and Sarla Ben nurturing uh, an ethic of social work and female emancipation in the Himalaya. So all four, uh, the four who stay on after independence, you know, contribute in very creative and important ways uh, to a democratic India, working outside the state system. You know, many nationalists join the government. They become ministers and MPs. Many of the nationalists go into the political opposition. So Kriplani and Rajaji and Lohia are in the political opposition. These people are in civil society. You know, they're working with ordinary folks, not seeking either political power or political influence, working towards social transformation and consciousness raising. And all our writers, I think one of the attractive things about all of them is apart from what they do, they leave behind a corpus of writing. You know, uh, uh, so they observe, document, analyze, and provide a record of what they've seen from which you can tell a larger story about India's move from a colonial to a post-colonial nation and society. Yeah. And I love the fact that Mira goes off to walk in the Vienna woods and devotes her life to Beethoven. Uh, can you talk us through that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, Mira, is a, Mira is a fascinating story. And I think there is possibly a feature film to be made about her because you know, here she is, an admiral's daughter, uh, you know, very high status with a home in the country, riding horses, uh, learns the piano, becomes a concert pianist, is on the margins of, uh, you know, uh, the kind of circuit, doesn't really make it. He admires Romain Roland, the French writer, for his works on his biography of Beethoven, goes to meet Roland, who introduces her to Gandhi. She flips towards Gandhi, spends the next 30 years in India, and then while in the Himalaya, in her ashram, Beethoven comes back to her and she goes back. And uh, uh, first wants to go to England, but decides that England is cold and inhospitable and then settles in Vienna, near the Vienna woods, which are so identified with Beethoven. And is still interested in Gandhi, writing about Gandhi, inspiring Attenborough, as I said, but rediscovering Beethoven, studying his works and writing about him. And a few years before she died, she wrote a book on Beethoven, was able to get a forward by Yehudi Menuhin, but could not succeed in getting a publisher because essentially there was really nothing new uh, from a, the point of view of musical criticism or musical history. It was just a kind of a long, extended, rambling love letter from a disciple to her master, <laughs> Beethoven. And that book was not published in England, in Europe. And Mera Ben's Austrian friends read an article that Rukun Advani had written about music. Rukun Advani was then an editor of the Oxford University Press. And they sent it to him, saying, will you publish it? And he read it and politely wrote back saying it's unpublishable. And finally, many years later, Mira Ben dies in 1982. Many years later, it's published by a Gandhian press in Madurai. So it's the first, first and last book on Beethoven, indeed on Western classical music ever published by a Sarvodaya press. But it's a touching tribute and acknowledgement of what Mirabhan did for India, you know, that they said, okay, we won't let this work go unpublished, even if we have to, you know, publish 500 copies. One of them is my cupboard there, actually. I, I have a copy and I could go through it. I mean, I tried reading it, but it's clearly something which uh, uh, obsessed her and she wanted to get out. So it's, it's I think she is, uh, given all these twists and turns in her life, uh, I think... She, Someone should make a feature film about her, probably, yeah. But she, of course, then met Richard Attenborough about another feature film. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes, yes. Yes, I mean, that she's, uh, I, I mean, 
uh, essentially uh, she was the person outside India, the only person outside India who was really close to Gandhi. So in India, you had Nehru, whom Attenborough briefly met before Nehru died. Uh, there was Rajagopalachari, who was old and not really interested in films. And there was Kripalani. But uh, I, I, they were not, the, I mean, they were like very, uh, Kripalani and Rajagopalachari were very matter of fact people. So they were alive in the 70s. But they're not the kinds of people, with due respect, no offense, man. They're not the kinds of people who would say, okay, come in, you want to make a film about Gandhi? I'm going to give you eight hours of my time. You know, they had other things to do, which is, for example, uh, in the case of Kriplani, saving in, uh, India from the dictatorship of Indira Gandhi. So, so Mira Ben opened her doors to Attenborough and gave him many hours of her time. And she was very intimate with Gandhi because she joined Gandhi in 1925 and uh, left him only in the mid 40s. So the kind of climactic periods of Gandhi's life, the salt march, the Quit India movement, the jail terms, the anti-untouchability movement, the fast for Hindu-Muslim harmony, she was there. So I think she gave Attenborough a great deal of insight and information. Uh, she was then cast in the film, and I, I think it was Glenda Jackson who played her. And she said this lady, she saw the early rushes of the film. The film was shown after she died, but she saw the early rushes. And she wrote to Attenborough saying, the person who plays me is looks much more glamorous than me. I never looked so good you know, on screen. So yeah, it's, it's, it's a lovely story. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, you dedicated the book to your friend, uh, the Belgian-born Indian economist, uh, Jean Rez. What kind of rebel is he? Well, he's very much carrying on in the tradition of, of, of these people. Now, I should uh, reveal a secret, which I have not revealed in public before. Uh, this book's original title, uh, the title under which has been, it has been traveling for the last decade or decade and a half while I've been writing it, was Renegades. <coughs> Renegades, and the subtitle was always Western Fighters for India's Freedom. Now, so it turned out about five or six months ago, my American publisher, this book comes out in America next month, uh, discovered that Barack Obama and Bruce Spin Springsteen had written a book, were, write, were publishing a book called Renegades, born in the USA. So they told me, you have to change your title. There's <laughs> no copyright in, in book titles. And, you know, you can't compete with Barack Obama and Bruce, Bruce Springsteen. So I chose this fallback title, which is fine enough. I mean, I'm quite happy with Rebels Against the Raj, which kind of captures the spirit of the book and it has this subtitle. But in the last minute in the proofs, I had to change the dedication because the dedication was originally for Jean Drez, comma, a renegade of our times, which may, would have meant, uh, made absolute sense in the context of my original title. But now that I had a different title, it just says blindly for Jean Drez. But he is a renegade of his time. He gave up his, his nationality, his race, his, his religion. Uh, he lives in India. He's married an Indian. Uh, he speaks flawless Hindi. He is... Talking about travel, uh, Naresh, Jean has traveled to many, many more parts of India than you and me combined. Probably all the audience today combined. I mean, no one understands the lives of ordinary Indians in different parts of northern and eastern India better than him. And he's traveled extensively in the south too, you know, or in second class trains, buses, walking from village to village. He's a wholly admirable man. I must say, I don't always agree with him on economic and social policy. We have our debates and our arguments. But he is a, um, you know, he's an adornment to our country. And I think he's very much in the tradition. He works in the tradition of the seven renegades I write about in this book. Mm. Ram, you've devoted a considerable part of your life to writing biographies. There's your magnificent uh, book on the anthropologist Beria Elwin and the magisterial work on Gandhi. Um, what is it about the form of the biography uh, that attracts you as a writer? And uh, as a reader, because I know you read a lot of biographies. Well, obviously, you know, uh, the bio uh, biography is uh, something the closest you get to literature in history, history writing, because it's about relationships, emotions, struggles of ordinary human beings, or sometimes extraordinary human beings. And I came to biography writing by accident. And it was really because I wanted to, I got so intrigued by the figure of Elvin, who had played such an important role in my own life. It was reading Elvin that... Uh, made me move from economics to sociology and then to history. And, um, you know, so I, as a, as a sociologist, I would write about structure. As a historian about process, 
And as a biographer, I had to learn to write about personality without completely forgetting structure and process. So the broader social, historical, political background had always to be there. It was not just anecdotes or one letter so, uh, after another strung together. So the you know so I became a biographer partly by accident. I've enjoyed the form. Uh, uh, one of the nice things about this book uh, is that the, it's the first time I've written about women. You know, so between Elwin and um, and Gandhi, uh, a corner of a foreign field, which is set in your city, is also partly biographical, but it's about male cricketers. A, a great deal on Panwankar Balu, quite a lot on Indian cricket's first superstar, CK Naidu, and so on, but it's about males, right? And I think one of the enjoyable things about Renegades uh, was that I was able to flesh out the lives of these three women characters. So it was a kind of a new experience for me. I can't say whether I've succeeded entering their minds and their emotions and, and their sentiments and their feelings. But I think that is what one of the things I enjoyed about this book that I was writing about, not only about men. Mm. Um, in your prologue, you say, um the lives and doings of these individuals constitute a morality tale uh, for the world we currently live in. Could you explain that, please? Yeah, so uh, uh, in that, uh, we live in a world driven by xenophobia, you know, and jingoism and hypernationalism. And that's not just true of our country, Naresh, it's true of uh, England, America, China, Russia, Turkey, Hungary, and so on and so forth, you know, uh, that, there's a wave of xenophobia sweeping the world where populist politicians come to pass saying, we, our country, our culture, our civilization has all the resources required to solve our present problems. And those who want a more open-minded approach to the world are anti-national, are betraying the essence of our culture, our nation, our religion. And I, I find this kind of uh, way of thinking deeply repugnant. It's also contrary to the traditions of freedom struggle of how people like Gandhi and uh, Tagore and Ambedkar and Nehru just embrace the world. I mean, the story of Mrs. Kohli, for example, you started with, right? Now, so, of course, I wrote this book not as a moral science lesson or a politics lesson. I wrote this book to evoke a certain uh, uh, period in Indian history in which these seven characters were able to play important roles. But I realized as I was writing it, that it speaks to the world today and not just to India. I mean, I think uh, it's not just the RSS, uh, which promotes this kind of paranoid uh, tunnel vision of uh, India's place in the world. But if you look at Turkey, you know, Turkey is very much like India in that regard, you know, a great civilization, uh, which could have actually engaged with the world on much better terms, which would have been, you know, Turkey would have been, had it not taken the populist jingoistic Turn, combined with a personality cut, not similar, not dissimilar to us, Turkey would have been a rising economic and social power, you know, and it's now in a mess, economically, socially, politically in a mess. So I think uh, and Turkey was at the confluence of East and West. It was a place where there were Jews, there were Christians, there were foreigners, you know, all contributing to Turkish society. And now it's kind of just closed into itself. So in that sense, I think, I hope this book not just in India, but elsewhere also, tells the story of how people, regardless of their national or racial or religious or cultural origin, can identify with another people and so complete. Evidently, there are lots of questions, but before we go into them, I think, you know, I love the, uh, what Sarla uh, Devi wrote to the, the district magistrate in 1943, uh, where he tried to restrict her movements. And she said, we must all do our duty as we see it, loyally and honestly uh, to the cause our conscience dictates. And I think that's a good way uh, for us to think about uh, what our actions in the present moment. Uh, let me look at uh, the questions that were being sent. Whoops, there's quite a, a series of them. Uh, first one from Priya Parikh. Um, do you think the foreigners who worked uh, for our freedom have been given enough recognition there are so many we don't know about. Should they not be celebrated by the state? Well, I don't believe in celebrations by the state uh, per se, because it's normal, usually celebration by uh, the party in power, distorted celebrations, 
which misrepresent the person and their legacy, as has happened with Bose and Patel, for partisan political interests. But certainly historians and writers and journalists should be writing about them, you know. So I think that I would say there are many forgotten characters in our history, not just foreigners, in our modern history, out in interesting, creative, important things. And writers and scholars should document their lives and showcase them. State celebration I find problematic. You know, I think uh, historians should be wary of identifying with the state or with a political party. They write to reach a general audience, like as constituted, uh, uh, you know, by those who are part of literature life. So not state celebration. That the what the state does is none of my business. And sort of you've started an initiative to move towards trying to uh, commission biographies uh, of of figures. Yeah haven't got that you could you tell us something about that well that's just starting but i, I, I mean generally uh, i just say this that you know i've always it's wonderful that uh, uh, there's so much interest in biography nowadays you know when i started out back uh, 30 years ago researching elwin uh, you know there were just a handful of decent biographies and they were usually of gandhi ambedkar nehru those kinds of people you know they weren't of uh, that's about it and you know i think uh, now that people are writing about lesser known figures uh, uh, and in interesting and unusual ways, you know, for example, Dindyar Patel's book on Dalavai Naroji, uh, which is a wonderful work of scholarship about a man who also strongly connected with Bombay, who has generally been written about out of the nationalist narrative. I mean, the last book on Dalavai Naroji, who was a figure of colossal importance in the history of India and the history of England. The last book on him, I think, was by R.P. Masali in 1939. Okay, now, so people like that, you know, I, uh, there's a young uh, scholar, I won't uh, name her, so as to not embarrass her, uh, who's writing a PhD on J.B. Kriplani. Fascinating man, you know, Kriplani joined Gandhi in 1917, before Nehru, Patel, Azad, Bose, anyone, was a born maverick, a born rebel, uh, an early promoter of Khadi, but he argued with Gandhi, uh, he left. The, he was the last president of the Indian National Congress before independence in 1947. But then he said, "I'm not going to be with Nehru and Patel." And you know, he started the Socialist Party. He uh, uh, criticized Nehru's China policy rightly. He was an opponent of the emergency in the 90, in, in his 90s. You know, uh, there is there are two people. If I was just a question, my wife Sujata asked me just yesterday, and I was telling her about the emergency. You know, because we talk a lot about the emergency nowadays for obvious reasons. And I was telling her that how every political leader and activist opposed to Indira Gandhi was arrested. They were, as far as I know, there were only two people, important people who opposed the emergency and were not arrested. One was Kiplani and the other was MC Chagla. Because he, Mrs., their record of service to the nation was so much older than Indira Gandhi's that she may have been embarrassed to arrest them. But a biography of Chagla, you know, a jurist, a writer, a diplomat, a minister, you know, I would be fascinated. I hope someone is writing about Chagra, for example. So there are a lot of these kind of figures below the Gandhi, Ambedkar, Nehru, Bose, Savarkar, Patel rank, you know, of different, from different backgrounds. The Naga leader, Angami Zapo Fizo, uh, a historian, very good historian, uh, uh, Chitralekha Zuchi, has written a book on Sheikh Abdullah, which will come in the series I'm planning in Indian lives. It's the first good biography of Sheikh Abdullah. And Sheikh Abdullah was a fascinating character who impacted the history of Kashmir, India, and Pakistan. So we have to go to these kinds of people. You know, my late friend Keshav Desi Raju, before he died, wrote a great book on MS Subalakshmi. You know, so these are the kinds of people below the Nehru Gandhi types of guys. You know, of course, you will always have reassessments, re, re evaluations of the great figures of modern Indian history, but it's the fascinating figures a level below them that I think deserve their mm. bi biographies. Um, from Ravi Narayan um, comes the question, uh, were these people considered anti-nationals in their own countries? <laughs> well, they were, it's interesting. They were con considered as disloyal traitors to the British Raj, to the British race. And Honeyman, for example, was hated by the Bombay government, by the governors and the chief secretaries, because uh, uh, they just detested him. But back in England and America, there was an anti-imperial tradition already, which welcomes us dissenters. 
So Honeywell was admired by A.G. Wells and Bernard Shaw for what he did. But the Bombay governor wanted him deported. So they were regarded as traitors to their race in India, for sure. Um, Nita pa uh, Pal asks, many of these Western freedom fighters lived and spent their lives in India. Were there were they people who supported India's freedom while living in their home countries? Uh, I suppose, uh, and uh, did they have a significant impact? Yes, they did. I think um, uh, in England, for example, uh, the Labour Party and the <coughs> Communist Party had activists who supported the Indian freedom movement, and uh, they did have an impact. So they were they were these were British anti-imperial radicals living in, in in England. I mean, I mentioned the names of. Wells and Shaw, but George Lansbury, Fenner Brockway, uh, uh, you know, uh, there was India League, uh, which Krishna Bharat helped found, which had many British members, which was active in the 1930s and 40s. And of course, when the Labour Party won power in 1945, uh, the, it was people like this who pressed them to move more quickly towards Indian independence. Uh, Namneet Singh Pal asks, Clearly, all the Westerners were inspired by Gandhi. Uh, were there other leaders at that time uh, who also inspired the foreigners? Well, in different ways. So, I mean, my book is about uh, restricts, restricts itself to those who uh, courted arrest or were deported. But, for example, if you look at uh, uh, Sister Nivedita, who worked with Vivekananda, you know, or you will look at Leonard Elmhurst, who worked with L.C.F. Andrews, who worked with Tagore and with Gandhi. So the leaders of not just Gandhi, so Tagore and Vivekananda are again examples of Indian patriots who were not xenophobes and jingoists, you know, who are open to the world and learning from the world and welcome interactions with engagement with and cooperation from white people who are interested in working with them. I mean, look at Shanti Niketan, and it's not just white people. Shanti Niketan was a visionary uh, enterprise. It had Chinese scholars, Japanese scholars, you know, a foreign artist, poets. And I think that's, it's that spirit of the time, which Gandhi, Tagore, Vivekananda and others all embody, of which we seem to be losing. Um, Gopal Sai says, it's interesting that most of these people married Indians. Um, did the Indians who married them have to go through significant family and social opposition? Of course, uh, they would have had, for sure, for sure. I think there are two who married Indians. Uh, Stokes and, and, and Spratt. And an interracial marriage is difficult on both sides. I mean, you know, even in India today in 2022, you see the hostility to a woman marrying outside her caste or someone of different religion. And patriarchy basically wants to control the lives of, of the young women. And absolutely. So Sita Spratt and Agnes Stokes, it was an act of courage and bravery for them as much as for their husbands marrying across the racial boundaries. And they both successfully raised interracial uh, families. I mean, they both had many children, grandchildren who are alive, working. Spratt's uh, Stokes' descendants are still active in Himachal. You know, uh, and I think uh, uh, in that sense, you know, that even their familial legacy carries on, not just their intellectual or moral legacy, even uh, their familial legacy carries on. Um, Bala asks, uh, S asks, uh, would you say Mirabhan is an icon for women's empowerment even today? Well, I think not. Well, that's well. Obviously, all three women in my, in my book, uh, Adi Besant, Mira Ben, and Sarla Ben, were independent-minded. Uh, had uh, in terms of their courageous personal courage, had insights into how society was evolving, uh, uh, how society should be reshaped, what were the evils that Indian society suffered from. Uh, but uh, I, I don't believe in icons. I mean, you can, be, you can read them, be inspired by them, but they lived a very long time ago. So uh, clearly, uh, none of them can fully answer or satisfy the doubts and anxieties we have today, but certainly they can inform them. Um, Arun Ji asks, how long did it take for you to research this book? To what extent is the book written as a historian and your personal view? So it's largely written as a historian, as a biographer, but obviously I was attracted to these people. Uh, otherwise I would not have been writing about them. Now, as I say in the epilogue to this book, in the, actually the acknowledgement of the book, 
I want I have wanted to write this book for the last 20 years, ever since I wrote a book on Elway in 1999. I've wanted to write a companion volume on not one, but a group of such uh, fascinating rebels against the Raj. And over the last 20 years, while working on Gandhi, while working on Indian political history, I've been gathering material on them. So it's been in the making 20 years. I've not been working full time over the last 20 years, but in every, for example, I take my notes in notebooks like this. And before I, I, I kind of owned a, owned a laptop, this is one of, one of, one of my one of, one of 100 notebooks I have on my archival notes. And there's always a section in, in each of these notebooks called Other Side of the Raj, which is material I found on these rebels. So it's been, it's been in my mind for a long time. And after I finished my second Gandhi volume, I had to really uh, sit down, sort out my notes, begin to classify and organize them. And write them. Um, I think that was the last of the questions. Uh, and we're coming in right on time. Uh, thank you so much, Ram, for sharing your insights about uh, this fascinating book. Uh, and I urge everybody to rush out uh, and buy it uh, immediately. Tina, over to you. Thanks, Arish. Thank you so much, Mr. Guha and Narish, for keeping us enthralled with this eye-opening conversation today. Um, actually, I have a quick question of my own uh, for you, Mr. Guha. Um, I wanted to know, uh, is there a common character trait that you see in all seven of your uh, protagonists? Not really. I mean, they're very different and diverse. What unifies them is that they all become Indians. They mm -hmm. all take the ultimate step of courting arrest or being deported and some even marry Indians, and all have interesting, complicated relationships with Gandhi. But their lives are very diverse. I mean, in that sense, you know, there are seven distinct individuals united by a common cause, freeing India from Western imperial rule. Right. But certainly very courageous, I felt, even though they all seem so very different. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much uh, for that. I'd also like to thank our wonderful audience for joining us today. Stay tuned uh, through our social media for more such exciting literature-packed evenings. Thank you, everyone.